Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope and we're delighted that you've joined us today. You know, this program that TBN provides here in Central Florida, the opportunity to know what it is that brings smiles to those of us that live in Central Florida, a smile to our face. You know, sometimes we think that uh, there's so many bad news clips on the television that we don't think anything good is happening in our community. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. And our guest today here on Joy in Our Town will convince you of that as well. We're just delighted that you have joined us. We want you to sit back and re relax. And for the next 28 minutes, we're going to tell you a story of hope and we're going to give you help and we're going to pray together and we're going to realize that before we're done, there's a reason to have joy in Central Florida. And it's all because Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Amen. You know, when the scripture uh, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus makes this interesting declaration. He, he talks about in the last days that there will be things that people will do that will mark them as knowing that they are followers of Jesus. And you know what one of those are? It's visiting those that are in prison. It's critical and it was crucial to Jesus and it's crucial to us. And it's because of that that I want to welcome today Dr. Joe Marr. Joe, Thank welcome you. to Joy in Our Town. Thank you. And Bruce. Reverend Pedro Sosa. Welcome, Pedro, to uh, Joy in Our Town today. We're so delighted. Now, the reason I shared that verse of Scripture is because you gentlemen are involved in a ministry called Prisoners of Hope International. Yes, sir. Joe, you are the uh, chair of the board, and you are an advisor. Yes. So this ministry is not very old. Help our viewers to know that they can, be, they can be happy because God has raised up something new in our community. Tell us about uh, Prisoners. I think, I think it's, people should be very happy because when prisons, when prisoners get out of prisons, where are they going to go? They're going back into our communities. And when they come back into our communities, they're going to be our neighbors. And then when they're our neighbors, if they haven't had a change of heart, then they're going to end up right back in prison. And the recidivism rates show that. But what this ministry does is that we work with those prisoners and we bring them into a home. And it is a Christian home, a Christian environment that helps them prepare themselves to go into, back into society and be good neighbors and good citizens. So prisoners of, of hope are individuals that have come out of jail or prison. Yes, sir. Uh, they have been convicted of something. Right. And you surround them yes, sir. with teaching and training and spiritual yes, atmosphere and hope in that. Uh, it's new. How long has uh, this ministry been going? It's very new. It's only eight months old. And I can tell you, eight months ago, when Bishop Samuel Cotto, who has been involved with this type of ministry almost his whole life, when he mentioned it to me about starting a facility like this, we'd only had $400 in the bank. And I thought to myself, this is wonderful, the concept is right, but we're not getting anybody to donate money to us. We don't have a church to support us. At that time, we were on our own. And we needed $2,500 to rent this facility. And uh, by trade, I'm a golf cart mechanic. I work on golf carts. And I'm working on a golf cart, and a gentleman rode up to me on a bicycle and said, hey, aren't you that guy that works in ministry? And I said, yes. He says, what are you doing now? And I explained to him the prisoners of hope. And I told him we needed $2,500, but we only have $400. But we're trusting God for it. Right. Now, I wanted to believe that. But, you know, sometimes our heart doesn't always get up with us. Guy comes back 15, 20 minutes later, hands me an envelope with $2,500 in it. Wow. I knew then this was God's will for us. And every since then, it's been one miracle after another. And on my left is Pedro, who is one of those miracles. Well, and I was just going to go there because I think it's significant that when God does something, he always does it supernatural, Amen. Right? right? That's Amen. the evidence. Man can make his plans, but it's God that directs our steps. Amen. And when God directs the steps, then we know God's going to do something supernatural. So he's opened the ministry, but obviously something happened in your life, Pedro, and I, I think it's an amazing thing that we have we, we have a ministry there, it's there, but so, you are the proof sort of in the pudding that God does things. Yes, Why don't sir. you tell, tell me your story? What was your life like? Uh, um, you know, actually, I grew up in Orlando. You know, I was born in Puerto Rico, but I was raised in Orlando. And um, at a very young age, at the age of 14, I began to sell and use drugs. And um, by the age of 16, I was addicted to heroin, selling heroin. And um, right away when I turned 18, um, I was arrested for selling heroin. And um, 
found myself in the county jail in 33rd Street Jail. And um, I was in the jail um, probably about a week. And um, I was walking with another uh, brother, another guy that was in jail. And um, I get pulled aside by a correctional officer. And um, he asks both of us, you know, if you guys, um, if you guys died today, where would you go? And um, right away, the African-American brother said, you know, if I died, I'm going to heaven. And he's like, well, how do you know that? He said, because I, you know, I grew up in church and I know Jesus. And then he asked me and I said, well, I guess I'm going to hell. And he said, well, do you want to change that? And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, you change that by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And um, right then and there on the spot, I accepted the Lord as my, as my Savior. Wow. And I want to just pause for a moment because I think this is really significant, folks. A correction office, not yes, a chaplain, no, not a preacher, not a pastor, a, a guy that with a gun on his belt and, uh, and, and a uniform on was the guy that yes, I sir. think that is fantastic. That's being salt and light in, yes, in a dark world in, in the midst of that. Absolutely. So that the journey wasn't over at that point, was it? No, it wasn't. Um, you know, I accepted Christ. I didn't know what to do. No, nobody, you know, my family didn't grow up in church. So um, I began to pick up the Bible and read it, and um, I would pray things that only God could answer. And God would answer my prayers, and so God was letting me know, listen, I'm hearing you. But um, when I got out of jail, I went back to my old lifestyle, to my old ways, you know, and um, started selling again and, and using and found myself going to prison this time. And I went to prison and um, shortly got after prison, and I had goals in life to go to college, and I accomplished those things, and, and things were going great. I was going to church, and... But once again, the enemy came attacking me, and I started selling used drugs again. And in April 2014, I found myself in a very dark place. I mean, um, I was using a lot and selling a lot, and um, I had a praying mother. I had a mom that kept believing in God and, and coming over to my apartment and praying over me. And just she'd anoint me with oil and say, you know, God has a plan for you. She didn't lose hope. And um, she had heard about a, a ministry which Bishop Sam Okoto ran, which was called House of Hope at the time. She said, listen, I would just really want you to go there and just, and just check it out. And, you know, inside of me, I was like, okay, another, because I had been in programs. You know, I'd been to jail, been to prison, been to program. I was beginning to lose hope. I was beginning to think, okay, you know, God, what's going on? You know, like, I know you're a God. You can heal me. Why isn't it happening? And um, so I agreed one day to go with her. We visited it, and um, I, I ended up going. I met Bishop Sam completed the program, became a staff, and um, come, got filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think that's key. You know, it's one thing is to accept the Lord as your Savior and know God, but it's one thing to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit. That's right. And um, Bishop Sam, is, it's very firm on that. He believes in that, and he, been, he began to, to show me that. And um, so one day um, he came up to me and he said, listen, you know, God spoke to me, and um, he told me to start a new ministry. And um, I'm going to do it. I, know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to step in faith because that's how we do it. And I feel obligated to let you know that I'm going. And, you know, it's up to you if you want to come with me. And um, it was a no-brainer for me. You know, I, I said, absolutely. You know, if you're moving on, I want to move on with you because um, I just had peace. You know, I prayed about it. He taught me everything I do to pray. And, and, and I prayed. And, and here we are today. And so now you are returning back to the prisons, if I understand. Yes, sir. So you're in there talking to men just like yourself. Absolutely. Not only am I going into the prisons, but I also run the home where the guys, once they're released from prison, I'm the one that runs the home and, and leads them. And it kind of shows them that the addict, the drug dealer, the prisoner, the man in jail can change and be transformed. Sure. So there are two things that I want to point out, and I think yes, it's really key that you've said, Pedro, and that is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Uh, we, we try to change on our own, and we know program after program. Our, our world is full of programs, yes, but sir. God didn't uh, give us programs to change no, us. And, and talk to me about that experience for you, because I think there are a lot of people that sometimes are even, uh, they, they may misunderstand the Holy Spirit or they're awkward with the Holy Spirit. When you encountered the Holy Spirit, what happened that brought about that kind of transformation? And when we get through with that, I want to talk about then the structure that goes around that because I think those two pieces are important. Yes, sir. Uh, well, one night, um, we, Bishop Sam called a prayer. He, he called us into the chapel, and he said, you know what? Tonight we're going we're gonna to ask Jesus to baptize you guys in the Holy Spirit. And I had been praying prior to that. I said, Lord, you know, if this Holy Spirit thing is real, I want this. If speaking in tongues... It's real. I, if it's going to draw me closer to you, God, I want it. And um, we immediately began to praise God and just manifest, and you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And um, 
Bishop started praying over me and, and, and just asking Jesus to, to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And I mean, I just was filled up. I began. It was amazing. And, and it was a change in that moment, right? I felt I had an empowerment that I never had before. Wow. Now, that is necessary, but obviously structure is necessary, Joe. So help us to understand. You're involved in the ministry. So what do men that are a part of the Prisoners of Hope ministry, what, what do they experience when they get to this home and they have a routine or a regiment? Tell us about that. I think the first thing that happens is that when they come in there, they have a clear structure. There's clear guidelines, you know, what you can do, what you can't do. The other thing is, is they have a group of, we have pastors other than myself and Bishop Samuel Cottle. We have others that come in there that volunteer their time to work with us. There's about seven or eight of them that come in. We have other chaplains. I'm a volunteer chaplain up at Marion Correctional Institution. We have one from Lake Correctional Institution that comes in as part of our team. We call it our staff. These guys see these men and women, there's women that come into that come and stand for the Word of God and stand up and, and show them what it looks like to be, uh, you know, to walk in, in the, you know, as a man of God would walk. They watch that. Then they have every morning they have prayer time. They have worship, you know, at least 45 minutes of worship. Tuesday, every Tuesday, we have a cycle of pastors that come in and preach messages, not only from our staff, but from local churches. And then on Sundays, they go to different churches. You know, the whole group goes out. So they're getting plenty of experience with other people who are Christians who can show them that you can make it as a Christian. Our biggest challenge, I think, in the whole ministry is when people come in, they're still living in the past. They may have been saved. They may have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and we believe they are saved, but they aren't changed. And, and they are not going to change until they get rid of the old man, as, as the Apostle Paul says. They've got to quit thinking of the past and keep going back to the past. Our goal and challenge in all the classes, and they get classes every day, you know, spiritual classes. For example, one of them might be on manhood. Mm -hmm. You know, one of them is on, I teach a class on leadership. And it's not just leadership of an organization, but it starts with leadership of yourself. And until you can take control of yourself, and lead yourself in the proper way. You cannot lead another man, and you cannot lead other men or facilities. So with all that coming down, they're getting this every day, every day, every day. It's Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, Jesus at night, prayer at night, study at night, classes, and a constant flow of Christians coming in and showing them how to walk. So what you're saying is, is that it's a strong discipleship uh, ministry mm -hmm. program exactly. where you were taught and trained how to be able to know the Word of God, live in the Word of God, and then ultimately get out because that's the challenge. We're going to have to take a break in just a minute, Pedro, but before we do, um, the, the challenge of, real quick, back when you accepted Christ and you got out, what was the missing piece that caused you to go back to the ways that you, you went back from or you felt like you wanted to step away from? What drove you back? What was missing that this ministry had gave you that will never let you go back again? Um, well, what was missing was, you know, a spiritual father, a covering. You know, um, I would go and I didn't know where to find the spiritual covering. I didn't, you know, I would go to churches and I never really found a, a church home, you know, and um, that was key. You have to fellowship with other believers. You have to surround yourself with active people that are, are living the Word of God. You can't go back to your old neighborhood. You can't go back to your old friends. And I thought I could, you know, because I went back home. I had really no choice. I didn't, I didn't heard of the ministry of, of this stature, you know, of this empowerment. So that's key. They, they need to surround themselves with believers. They need to find themselves with a fellowship and a church that's going to embrace them and let them feel, you know, I always say it's so much more than just getting off drugs or, or it's, it's finding your calling and and that's what we want to do in these men's lives. Fantastic. Uh, friend, this is why there's joy in Central Florida because of people like <laughs> uh, Chaplain Joe here and Pedro who are experiencing the reality of God's transformational life in them. 
Uh, we have got so much more to talk about because when we come back from our break, we want to talk to you about the whole idea of the ministries and the needs within the prisons because our, our viewers need to know what's really going on and how they can step up. But if you want more information, there will be on your screen. You can get all the information that you can reach out to Prisoners of Hope and you can find uh, direction and counsel and support there. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll pick it up. We'll keep talking to Joe and Pedro because they have more to share with you. There is joy in Central Florida because of Jesus. You stay with us and we'll be right back. Get caught buzz driving and you could do some hard time. Craig, knock it off. Sorry, Mom. It could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And that could set you back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and we're so delighted you're with us. We're just trying to help you to smile today because there's so much that Jesus is doing in Central Florida. We want you to know about that. And today it's my privilege to have Chaplain Joe Marr with us and uh, Reverend Pedro Sosa, who are both involved in the ministry called Pioneer, uh, Prisoners of Hope International. And they are talking to us about the situations and concerns of ministry that goes out and reaches those that are incarcerated or those that are coming out. Let, let's talk for a moment about uh, our prison situation. I, I really don't know, and I'm sure our viewers don't know, what is the prison population in the state of Florida? Right now in the state of Florida, there's 100,000 men and women that are incarcerated. Now, is that in federal prisons or is That's that in, in jails? and in We're looking at the state prisons only. At the this state point. prisons yeah. only, 100,000 people. Yeah. And uh, in the midst of that, uh, give me some examples of the types of conditions of those prisoners and prisons and what these men are facing when they step into that. Well, if we want to talk particularly about the men, which I deal in a men's facility, so I, I know a little more about the men than women, but I'm sure it, it carries over to both sides. But when men come in there in the prison, obviously they're, 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 they're lost, they're, they're, they're confused, they're scared, and then when they get in there, they realize that, you know, this is the place that they're going to spend time with, so now they've got to figure out how to survive. So there's all kinds of ways of survival. And there are good ways and there are bad ways. There are gangs in the prisons. And the gangs can take over and grab the men and, and, and have them go in a direction that's not going to be healthy for them or for the prison or for the guards or anybody else. So it's very important that, you know, we get in there as Christians and as a Christian bringing training programs in and working with the men and women, that we go in there with programs that help them see there's a different way. Okay. And well, that changes their heart. So, Pedro, let's, let's bring you back in here because you went there when you were 18, you said you went to prison? I went to the county jail, jail. at 18. I went to prison at 19. So these things that uh, Joe is talking about, you saw them firsthand, right? Yes, sir. What was that? Ex were you afraid when you went? Well, yeah, obviously, you know, you think prison and what people say about prison, it kind of gives you fear. But, um, you know, I knew that I made it okay in the county jail, so I went kind of went to prison, you know, with me, it was a little different. I was, when you're, I was 18, but I wasn't big enough, so they put me with the YOs in a youthful offender camp. Okay. And there, um, they have what it is. They have uh, different ministries that go in and minister. So that's what you do. They'll, they'll call you out. You'll have a church to go to. You have men, like chaplains and ministers that go in and minister to you. But were there gangs? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's gangs. There's, that's one thing you're going to find there. <clears throat> It's like you go to prison, it's just like the streets. It's still people, there's still people selling drugs in there. There's still, still gang banging in there. Yeah. So. And, and again, I think that for those of us that have never been there, that it's hard to really grasp and understand. But as a man that's been there, um, what was the thing that you felt most um, needy for when you were in prison? Well, when, you, when you were laying on your bunk and... And I know there's a lot of time to elapse. 24 hours is probably a long time when, you're, when there's nothing to do but just be incarcerated. What was going through your mind? You know, there wasn't really nothing in plan to, like, help you for your next step about what you're going to do when you get out. There wasn't, like, a program 
like a ministry going in there and teaching what we're teaching, a discipleship program. There wasn't anything to teach you about to build a career. So it's kind of you're just sitting there and, and you're learning more about crime. So I, I felt that that was a need there, you know, that, that they needed to fill this gap to teach men and, and help them transition out. Sure. So, Chaplain Joe, let's go back to that because that's where you come in and that's what goes on. Right. So when you go to a prison and you step in uh, to a cell block mm -hmm. and you're going to do ministry, what does that look like? How, how do you do it when you step into a prison? What, what do you see is necessary and you offer those men? I think the most important thing that they're looking for is hope. They don't have any hope unless someone brings them hope. Uh, their situation is hopeless. They, they're, they're, uh, the fear may have been gone because they're having someone else, they're under someone else's covering. But that's not the covering that they want and they don't want it for the future. And they want a relationship back with their families. I mean, I go up there as a chaplain and I have men come in and sit with me all the time. And, and they sit there and they, they just cry when they realize what they did, not so much to themselves, but what they did to their families, what they did to their wives, their children. And many of them haven't seen their wives or children for a long time. If they could reconnect with them, which is why we reach out to the families and try to get them to reconnect, because that gives the men hope that there's, there's something on the other side. I think all this is important because so we put a lot of money. I, I know, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's a lot of money that's spent on what, what does uh, the cost to build and operate a prison in the state of Florida? It's $100 million to build it, $43 million to run them. And the budget is $2.3 billion across the whole state, and that's everything. $2.3 billion yes. is spent on 100000 Right. men and right. women right. that are incarcerated. Right. Did you hear that? $2.3 billion on 100,000 people that are incarcerated. Now, it's not that no. they don't deserve help and support, but that's the concern that we're there. You're but, saying that there needs to be that help. Yes, sir. Can I just add sure, a piece of absolutely. statistics that's very important here? Sure. Uh, and I'm just going to read off of here. There's 34,000 inmates released a year on average. On average. It changes, of course. And, after, and this is after completing 86.2% of their sentence. They can't get out earlier unless they've completed that much. 30% will be back in prison with a new offense within 36 months. Wow. That's, I mean, that's like, what happened? I mean, we didn't change them. We must have changed some, but there's a whole bunch that we're missing. A lot of guys and men and women that need changing. And 40.9% 40, 40 of all inmates admitted, admitted had been prior convictions. So you got 49% that already had convictions that are coming back. And as Pedro was reminding me that, you know, when you get your number, if there's letters, you know, other than zero, you've been there before. And there's a lot of those. Wow. So how does the Florida penitentiary system compare nationally to the systems nationally? Uh, our recidivism rate, now recidivism rate is that the number of people that come back right. within a three-year period of time. So from their release, they keep track of three years. And if they come back within that, of course, that adds to the recidivism rate. Nat, Florida right now is at an average 43 percent, and nationally it's over 50 percent. Are coming back? Yes. So, wow. Now, our viewers, there may be some viewers that are simply saying, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to them about, man, I, that moves me. Mm -hmm. uh, how c can they get involved and participate in what you're doing in I, stepping into a prison? Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're all about at Prisoners of Hope. We are there to get people who want to come and give these men hope. We want men, people who are going to come in there and help minister to them out of the gospel. And we're using the Word of God. And because we know that's effective and we know it works. It's working up at the Merritt Correctional Institution because right now they have a faith and character dorm up there. In fact, they have two of them. And it's all pretty much Christian based. Not all, but everybody can come in at once, at once faith. But I'm going to tell you something. The correctional officers up there have told me as a volunteer chaplain, they fight for that duty. Because in that dorm, they have less, less problems than any place else. Mm. Now, one last thing, the recidivism rate for those that have gone through these programs and attend Christian programs, their rate is so much lower. In fact, one-third of what everybody else's is coming out. Wow. So what we're saying is, is that we desperately need this ministry to flourish Amen. so that there can be more Pedros that yes, come sir. out yes, and sir. are able to, uh, yes, to in, in, enjoy not just freedom, but enjoy the liberty That's that right. Jesus Christ brings into your heart and life. Amen. Well, we're, we're just about uh, at the end of our time. And, and, and Pedro, I know that as, uh, as a man that's been there, there are, I'm sure, 
individuals that have been incarcerated that are watching this program or maybe moms and, and dads that have sons and daughters that are incarcerated. I'm going to ask you to just take a moment. I, I don't know how to talk to them. I'm just going to be honest. I, I've never had that in my life. I've, I've been there and, and ministered, but I don't know what that feels like, but you do. Would you just take a moment and look in that camera and talk to them and give them some hope? And then I'm going to ask you to pray for them yes, uh, so that we can just end our time together with the encouragement Jesus Christ can do for them what he did for you. Amen. You know, I'm here to tell you today that there's hope, and there's hope in Christ Jesus. You know, um, I know what it is to be an addict. I know what it is to be a drug dealer. I know what it is to be in jail and in prison. But you can't lose hope. You can't lose faith on that person you love. I'm here to tell the mother that may be struggling with her son or her daughter, don't stop praying. Don't start losing hope and keep the faith. Or the believer or the wife, don't lose faith. Keep hope. I'm here today because my mom didn't lose hope in me or Jesus didn't lose hope in me either. She continued to pray and believe in God. God has a purpose for your child, your son, your husband, whoever it is, excuse me, whoever it is that's in that prison, there's hope and there's a purpose for him. God created him. He knew him before he formed him in the womb, and there's hope for him. And we're, we're there. We're going to be there to try to help them. We're going to be praying for them and, and believing in God that, that they get a revelation of Jesus. Lead us in prayer, would you? Yes, sir. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, just thanking you, Father, for this time of fellowship, Lord, and being able to just bring hope to the addict, bring hope to the prisoner, Lord, bring hope to people that are losing hope and in and, and people and in life, Father. But we just ask, Lord, today that you comfort them, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we ask that you just bring hope into their lives, Lord, that you just continue, Lord, to, to give them strength, Father, because the joy of the Lord is our strength, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray that every chain be broken, any plan the enemy may have to attack the family or their loved ones, Lord, we come against it in the name of Jesus, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Joe, Amen. Pedro, thank, thank you. you for thank coming you so and sharing your story in the ministry. I want to encourage you that uh, if you want more information about uh, Prisoners of Hope, then you go to that web address on your screen and you just contact them and they'll be able to talk with you. If you've got family members that are in regional penitentiaries and you want someone to go in and visit, that's what this ministry is here to do. If you want to get involved and know more about how to go in, again, reach out to them because that's what this ministry is about. On behalf of TBN, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. This program exists to be able to inform you, the resident of Central Florida, on what God is doing. It should put a smile on your face. It put joy in your heart because Jesus Christ is on the throne. Amen. He is Lord and he's never going to stop being Lord. Well, we've got to go for today. We'll be back next week. So until then, don't you ever forget it. Jesus loves you. He really does. Bye for now. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.